and be consistent. Dogs don't do well with the gray area. So let's say you don't want your dog jumping, okay? And so you're working on not letting your dog jump, and we'll talk about these things later. And your dog comes over and jumps on you, and you're busy, and you don't think, and whatever, and so you start to pet your dog. And your dog says, hmm, nine times out of 10, or 19 out of 20 times, whenever I jump, they make me get off, they do whatever, and we'll talk about the whatever. But this time, I jumped up and they gave me the attention that I was seeking. Huh. So on the 21st time, it's like, hey, maybe this is that one in 20. It keeps them in the game. So you gotta decide your bottom line. I don't want my dog nipping. I don't want my dog jumping, whatever it is. My suggestion to you is those are two biggies, okay? Um, but whatever it is that you don't want your dog to do, you have to be consistent in, in, in showing them, and telling them, and I'll talk to you about how to do that effectively so that they learn that this isn't what I do. And we're going to talk about all of that in a little while. Okay? So be careful about treating your dogs like they're humans. You can give them love, attention, good things, but they're dogs. Okay? And you need them to have a role in the household. They need a job, just like the kids need to set the table and learn to take out the garbage, and they need responsibility, and they have to do things to get good things. Hopefully, you've got that set up that way. I never did. <laughs> easy for me to say, not so easy to do, right? But the fact is that dogs especially need to work for what you give them. And work can be just as simple as sit. Okay? You want this treat, you have to sit first. You want your food that I'm ready to put down on the floor, you have to sit and wait until I release you. You want me to pet you, you have to sit. You want to go out the door, you've got to sit and wait until I release you. Okay? So dogs, that's the work that dogs need to do. And it's going to be good for you, and it's going to be good for them because they'll feel secure, because they know what's expected, they know that good things always come, and so they're just gonna be compliant. Dogs do not hold on to behaviors that don't reap rewards. So if your dog is jumping, nipping, whatever, and it's continuing and you're doing whatever you're doing, and the, and the behavior continues and it's not extinguishing, that means that your dog is getting some type of reward from that behavior. Because dogs don't hold out to behaviors that don't work. They're not like humans. I mean, for all these years I've been with my husband, you know, I tell him, don't do this, don't do that, and I continue to do this even though it doesn't work. You know what I mean? He's still the same, he's still doing the same stuff, right? Not with dogs. Dogs, oh, this doesn't work to get what I want, I better find something that does. Gee, I jump on them to get attention, and they withdraw from me every single time. How, what the heck? How am I going to get attention? And we're going to be right there to show them sitting gets all the attention in the world. Playing calmly gets you all the attention in the world, not like the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Okay? So dogs do not hold on to behaviors that don't work you have to make sure that the behaviors don't work and i don't mean this in a negative way i don't mean physically challenging your dog no stepping on their paws or some of this junk that people say to do no holding their muzzle you know so they don't nip first of all that's not very good because you're going to end up getting bitten probably and if not you're going to end up with a fearful dog and we want our dogs to be confident dogs we don't want them to be fearful I see lots of dogs that really respect their owners, and boy, they toe the line. Oh, I don't do anything with him. I just sit here and I'm quiet. And those are the dogs that, yeah, but this person over here, I can take it out on them. It's like the abused, you know, person becoming the abuser. So we're talking about loving, positive training, and it works. But you have to be patient and you have to be consistent, and that's where our problems are. It's not the dogs. For the most part, unless the dog really genetically has some problems or there are some problems, for the most part, part if I can get you to modify your behaviors a little bit, your dogs are going to come along just fine. I'm more worried about you than I am about them. Truthfully, 
that. It's, it's, it's not, it's true. Now, I don't mean to put a guilt trip on you either, because people will come to us and say, oh, I know it's our fault. You know, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. No, no. It was that you didn't know. You didn't know. You didn't understand what was going on, okay? I mean, look, I've been studying dogs for a long time. Before I began studying and working with dogs, I didn't have a clue. When I think back, when I was younger and I had dogs, I mean, my dog used to chase after old women and babies. She didn't bite them, but she'd be right at their heels barking. And what did we do? I'd come to the door and say, lady, get in here. I was rewarding her. I was bringing her into the house with us. What a reward. She never got over that behavior, but I didn't know what I was doing, okay? So anyway, these are the things that you're here for, right? And there are tons of books out there, people, really good ones. Um, and sometimes it's hard for you to determine which are the good books, which aren't. I have a list of books on my website. Also, dogwise.com. It's a very good website to get books. Or if you find a book there that looks good, see if your library can get it so you don't have to buy it, etc., etc. Um, some books like The Monks of Mesquite, they're really outdated. Even though they have updated theirs, they're really not where it's at in dog training these days. A lot of people, you know, that was like the classic, the standard back, back when. Um, but there are a lot of excellent uh, behaviorists uh, who are writing books, Pat McConnell, Ian Dunbar, um, Gene O'Donnell, there, there are all kinds of people that are really into positive training and it's based on, you know, research, based on observation, you know, really well grounded and well founded. And um, so any of, any of their books are really good. But again, um, you know, if you want, you can go out to our site, take a look at the books, or just go to Dogwise and peruse what they have in there. Okay, so we talked about being um, the, uh, you know, the exercise, the socializing, mental stimulation, diet, that's another thing. When I was a kid, they just ate scraps. Whoever heard of kibble? I didn't know kibble until I was quite an adult. Seriously. I mean, our dogs just ate our food, whatever we had left over. Now, I'm not suggesting you do that, although a lot of people are doing home-cooked diets, but you really need to know what you're doing. It has to be a well-rounded diet, so you really do need guidance. And there are lots of good books out there about that. Vets, you know, talk with your vet about it, etc. And for those of us who don't have the time to be, you know, involved in that way, there are tons of excellent foods out there, and you're pretty much not going to find them at Petco PetSmart. You're pretty much going to find them at the smaller pet supply stores, okay? They have become competitive in that area. They carry a lot of really good brands. And anything in the supermarket, forget it. If you're getting your food off the supermarket shelf, I'm telling you, you need to rethink it. There are lots of good foods out there, and they're not necessarily that much more expensive than what you're buying at the market, unless you're getting something really cheap. And you really don't want to do that because we are what we eat, and dogs are what they eat, okay? And um, you want to make sure, and look, you're paying, you paid for the dog probably, you're paying for the vet, you're paying for the training, you want to give them some good food, okay? So um, people ask me what brands, there are lots of them out there, they're really good. Um, I have a, uh, a handout if you need it that uh, says what to look for when you're looking at the bag. I can tell you if there are any byproducts on that label, do not buy it. Basically what you're looking for is the very first ingredient should be whole sources of protein. Chicken, just chicken. <laughs> not chicken byproducts, not chicken meal. Meal isn't so bad, but really the best is to have whole, whole sources of protein, chicken beef, salmon, whatever. You don't want to see a lot of grains, okay? I usually give my dogs a grain-free diet. Dogs in the wild, and they're the way they're, they develop, they're carnivores, they would rarely eat grains. 
Okay. Can I just ask real quick, uh, for puppies, grain-free? Uh, you could, you could. Uh, first thing is always to check with your vet. Okay, your vet should know what you're feeding your dog. So talk to your vets. However, that being said, dogs are not nutritionists. I don't go to my doctor to find out about my diet. He's overweight, <laughs> he doesn't look real healthy. He knows a lot about diagnosing my problems, etc. But he is not the person I go to if I need nutritional advice. He is not the person I go to if I need advice about psychological and emotional advice about me or my children. You know, and it's the same with vets. Vets are good at what they do, they're excellent, they're good people. But when it comes to diet, a lot of them are still back in the old school. When it comes to behavior, we have vets coming into our classes and training with us because they have not really learned a whole lot about behavior in veterinary school. So, you know, people go and say, oh, I went to my vet and told him my dog is doing such and such and he said to do this, and it's like, or my breeder, oh, breeders are another one, you know. Okay, anyway, be that as it may, um, you know, there's something to be said to go into specialists um, when you really need to. Um, and, and as I say, the people at these small pet supply stores, many of them are really well versed. They attend conferences, they really study up on uh, canine diet, and they know their stuff. So, um, and the reason about grains is that a lot of grains are, uh, for example, uh, corn, soy are especially hard on dogs, so you really don't want those in your, your food. A lot of them are eliminating those today. Um, you really want a, a long list of whole foods before you get into the part that says, you know, ox is something, something, something that you can barely pronounce because they had to put it in in order to make this more nutritious. Do you know what I'm saying? So you want to make sure that the list of foods is a little bit, you know, it's fairly long before you get to that list of things that they had to put in, chemically or otherwise. Um, any questions, please, I, I'd love you to ask questions. You can interrupt me at any time um, for anything that you have on your mind. There are no stupid questions. I see a lot of people not asking questions, and I can tell, you know, and then finally someone raises their hand and asks, and you can see all the other ones going, yeah, like, oh, phew, somebody else asked that question. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate, all right? Um, okay. So, if there aren't any questions, are there any questions about any of that? And I know I'm going to throw a lot at you today. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to look at what you need for the class. Let's get that over with, okay? And then I'm going to answer your questions. And, and I'll answer your questions and we'll go from there. Okay, so first of all, on the handouts that I emailed to you, there was one that said, welcome. And that is the handout that says what you need for the class. And there are just three things. You need a plain collar, a leash, and time to train your dog every day. We, we recommend about 15 minutes. Obviously, if you can get more, we're going to talk about that. First of all, collar. Just a plain collar. So when I'm talking about, now we have big dogs. I told you about our kids, so we have big collars. All right, just a plain collar. Could be this, could be this. You know, just as long as it doesn't slip off over their heads. You know, for example, a greyhound will probably need a martingale collar that looks kind of like this, but it closes tighter when you when the dog pulls because otherwise their 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 uh, throats are bigger than that, and so things slip off. So sometimes dog, you know, special different breeds need different things. But basically, all you need is a plain collar. Okay. Now, those of you who have little dogs, and I think we have a lot of little dogs in this class this time. Um, Harnesses. If you have a little dog, you probably don't want to use a, a leash on a collar, especially if they do pull a little bit or whatever. We don't want to compromise their larynx, okay? Um, definitely, you don't ever want to be using choke chains or prong collars or any of that stuff, even with bigger dogs, because they tend to compromise the larynx. And, and plus, they're just not what our, we get dogs for, you know what I mean? To, to give them pain so that they'll stop doing what they're doing out of pain. You know, that's not why we have dogs. If you have dogs that are pulling, and, it, and so for backing up a bit, if you have a small dog, you may want to use a harness. If your dog is not a dog that pulls, then you can just use a regular harness, and usually the regular harness is your attached between the shoulder blades. Okay? 
Are you saying like a small dog, like a puppy, or like a small breed of a dog? Small breed. Oh, okay. Small breed, yeah. Now, if you have a dog that's pulling, there are a lot of humane head halters and harnesses on the market that give excellent control. All right, that, and you don't need those choke chains and all that stuff. Um, the two that we recommend that we find to be the most um, effective, the one that we like the best is the sensation harness. There is another one like this called the easy walk harness, which works for a lot of dogs. You know, it varies. You know, it depends on the dog, the people, the, the fit, and all of this. The reason we like this one is because it seems to hold the uh, adjustments fairly well, whereas the other one seems to slip a little bit more. But a lot of people prefer the easy walk to this, so it's just, you know, I tell people, get everything you can, try them all, bring back what you don't use, and keep your receipts, okay? Um, we do keep on hand the two that we like the best, so that if you want to get it from Glenn, and we're not, you know, we're not uh, retailers here, we just keep it for, for convenience, because people used to say to us, well, do you have it? And we'd say, well, no, you know, and then we'd have to send them along to that. And this one in particular, you can't buy it at the stores. You have to order it. Okay? Anyway, this harness, the way it works is it goes over the dog's head. This attaches under the legs, you know, under the belly, behind the front legs. So here's the dog's head. Here are the legs. And this is where you attach. Notice, it's at the chest. It's in front. It's a front attaching harness. So much better. Dogs that pull, if you have something where you're attached between the shoulder blades, like a harness, or if you're attached to the leash, it gives them more four-paw drive. You know, they have that low center of gravity. It doesn't take a big dog to pull you over, especially, you know, in the, in the winter and that kind of thing. So, and they come in all sizes, from very petite to very large. All right? So you're attached in the front, and when the dog goes to pull, it orients them back towards you. Very effective, very effective for most dogs. And I can't guarantee that every dog is going to be perfect on this, on this harness. But for most dogs, it works very well. And there's no learning curve. You put it on, the dog starts to walk, and it's like, oh. And people go, wow. It's like power steering, you know, they get really excited. So it's an excellent piece of equipment. Again, it's for dogs that pull. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, can I just train my dog not to pull? Yes, you can. But it takes a lot of work, a lot of patience, a lot of time. Some dogs just naturally are pretty cool about walking with you, and they're pretty calm and stay pretty close by and don't pull. Most dogs, it's like, look at this, look at that, and they're just pulling you over to see this and that and the other thing. You know, and so if you don't have time to train, use the harness. It's up to you. And while you're training your dog not to pull, you're going to need something to keep them from pulling during the outings when you don't have the time to train them. Because if you're training a dog not to pull, you're not going to walk very far. Because every time the dog pulls, you have to stop. You can't keep going, otherwise they're habituating the behavior. I pull and we keep moving. And what you have to teach them is, you pull, all forward motion, the thing you want goes away. Remember that, whenever you're trying to extinguish a behavior, like pulling, jumping, moving, whatever it is, when you're trying to extinguish a behavior, what you have to understand is that the dogs will learn very fast to do what it takes to get what they want or need. So our job is I forgot you were in here. Sorry. Our job is to hold. Rocks. See now that dog is really cute, but that dog jumps on people. So you know, even though I love dogs, I don't like dogs that jump on me because I have my nice white pants on, or if there's a person that's afraid of dogs. You know, I'll go into people's homes and they'll say, you know, the dog will come running over and jump on me, you know, and they will be cute. And I'm thinking, no, your dog just jumped on me. What's cute about that? If your kid came over and just threw himself on my lap, what would you say to your dog or to your child? 
You'd say, honey, that's not polite. We don't do that. But when it comes to our dogs, it's like we're the grandparents instead of the parents. Isn't he cute? He's on his lap. Oh, isn't that wonderful? No. What if I did, were afraid of dogs? What if I didn't like dogs? What if I had nice clothes on and your dog's feet are dirty? So, you know, even little dogs, even the ones you can't see if they're not on your lap, you've got to train them not to jump unless they're invited up. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. I'm, di I, I'm digressing here. Somebody put me back on track. I want to see if you're listening. What we need for class. What you need what for you class. Need. Okay, so we were talking about the harness. Um, so that harness is really the one that I would generally recommend. Now, there is something called the gentle lead. This is a head halter. There's also um, the hall tee, and there's some other ones of like this type of head halter. Um, we like the gentle lead the best. Again, because some of them have rings here and all kinds of places, and it just isn't as comfortable. But again, varies with the dog, so you know, you try them all. The way this goes, am I a good dog? See, it goes over the dog's muzzle. Now, it's not a muzzle. Your dog can still bite, chew, play frisbee, eat, whatever. This isn't meant to be a muzzle. And you want to buy the color of your dog's face so that it blends in. But most people now are aware that these are not muscles, because before people would say, oh, I don't want to use that. People are going to think I have an aggressive dog. He's got this thing on his nose. No, and most people now are aware of it. So it goes here, and notice where you're attached, under the chin. Again, front attaching harness, or head halter here, in this case. This was one of the first very humane pieces of equipment to keep dogs from pulling that came out, and the animal welfare organizations were all over it. They left it. Now, would I use this on my dog? Depends. This has a learning curve. What that means is I put it on and the dog goes, <laughs> you know, they have to become accustomed to it. Because, you know, when they've got something on their noses, it's like, get this off, what is this? They're rubbing on the ground, all this stuff. So it takes a little while to acclimate them to it. The dogs that I would use this on are dogs that are at the extremes of the spectrum. What does that mean? If I have a dog that's very reactive with other dogs, you know, or if I have a dog that's very fearful. So